want to take a moment to acknowledge the context in which we're hosting this webinar. And one of the things that we're doing here tonight is we're hosting a webinar across geopolitical and time zones. Jeff is joining us from halfway across the world. And we're also doing this against a backdrop where we all know exactly why we're here tonight. Um, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to give too much context on that. I think we know exactly what we're seeing. I think we know exactly what's happening. And I think everyone knows exactly why we're here tonight, but just to kind of step out a little bit of the purpose that I think Peace Action Wellington had in holding this space tonight so that you can get a sense of how we're going to move through it. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we're seeing, we, we, we all know we're witnessing a genocide, but I think one of the things that we need to be clear on is that we're witnessing a genocide that is happening with some of the most advanced military technology the world has ever seen. And as Jeff Halper talks about, you know, um, this is something that Israel has somewhat of a niche in. Some of the weapons technologies that are being used in a very real way, in a very brutal and violent way against the people of Gaza uh, are being tested, are being tested on the people of Gaza. And something else I wanted us to pay attention to in that is also something Jeff has talked about a little bit, which is that Israel's particular niche within the military industrial kind of space and markets is not only it's sort of the technologies it's using right now for this genocide, but also it's technologies of population control, which have been used um, over, particularly over the last decade or so, to really surveil and control Palestinian populations. And that's the fundamental underpinning of what we all know is going on in Palestine, that this didn't start on October 7th and that people have been living under the boot of Israeli occupation and Israeli control for 75 years. The technologies that are used for that control are advancing and where there is suffering, there is always profiteering. So tonight is about us having a material understanding of the world that we live in and a deep motivation to change it. So we're not instrumentalizing what's happening tonight. This isn't an intellectual exercise. We want to understand exactly what is going on so that we can use this information. And I encourage us all to make Fano. One thing that Val was really clear on is like, we're here to co-construct. We don't have a roadmap for exactly where we want to go with this information, um, but we're here to join together learn more, and then use that information to act in our context, in Aotearoa. Um, I know that we're reaching a point where many people are beginning to question every single thing around them, beginning to question the very foundations on which our world is set, because our institutions have failed us so gravely, and we know that we can't necessarily trust them to uphold the ideals of universal human rights for everyone. Um, I think that all of us are here tonight because we want to do something ambitious. And there's a collective kind of cry in the air at this time, which is for five months, we have been marching, we have been rallying, we have been doing these things, but nothing seems to be moving. And I think the question and the challenge that we must rise to, and I'm not going to use the word opportunity, even though I do believe that we live in an opportune time to rise to this challenge. I do not think it is an opportunity when 30,000 people are dying. But the challenge that we must rise to is how do we unpick these global systems which profiteer off war, off suffering, off population control, off domination. Um, so I think, you know, along, along that pretty heavy backdrop, you know, um, I believe that we're all here tonight because we want to do something ambitious we recognize that the systems of capitalism and the systems of colonization and the systems of military violence are all deeply connected and entangled in our world, and we are entangled in them. So we're here to learn tonight about what we can do in Aotearoa. And um, Jeff, just for you, for your information, here in Aotearoa, we have a document um, called Te Siriti. Aotearoa, New Zealand is also a settler colonial nation. 
much like Israel, and it's a past sometimes that we refuse to reckon with. But I think what's important to note is that the intentions of Te Tiriti or Waitangi were for our peoples, so those of us who are guests here, who are settlers here, um, Tanga Te Tiriti, the people of Te Tiriti or, or Waitangi, were to live in a respectful partnership with Tangata Whenua, Mana Whenua, and uh, Māori, the Māori people. And what we're, what we're witnessing now is that the intentions of that document were about us respecting each other's ability to live. And Māori have been doing a great job of upholding their side of the bargain on that. But right now, our settler government in this country is attacking the very foundations of what set us up to be able to operate together in partnership and one of the many gifts we've been given in living here. So I think it's a great honour to have both of you here. I think one thing that I want to note is that both of you come with a wealth of experience. And while we recognise that there's many people joining the struggle and joining the issue, I'm really glad that we're here to listen to the two of you because you've been around doing this for a while. Um, Jeff, Jeff was joking. I met him 10 years ago. He said, you must have been six. But I think, Jeff, you have definitely been doing this since I was six. We might not have been six last time we met, but you have been doing this for decades. And I think at a time like this, when we have so many new people coming on board, wanting to learn, wanting to get involved, it's pertinent that we actually listen to people who have been studying these systems and not just studying them, but acting against them for decades. And so, Val and uh, Jeff, I know you very much live into that. So, for those of you who don't know Jeff Harper, Jeff Harper is um, the director of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions and the co-founder of the One Democratic State Campaign. Um, his two most recent books are Decolonizing Israel and Liberating Palestine and War Against the People, which is really the the topic that we're going to be exploring tonight. And um, I'm sure many of you here know the indomitable... <laughs> Valerie Morse, how could you not? Um, I want to mihi to you, Valerie, because in 2009, the first time I ever got involved in protesting against that incursion in Gaza, you were there, you were making the connections about Aotearoa as a settler colonial nation and also about um, Israel and Palestine, and you have been doing that work for a very long time. So, now um, mihi nui kōrua. I am going to hand the floor over to Jeff. I'm very excited for us to get into it and hear what you have to share with us, Jeff. All right. Thank you very much, Nadia. Um, thank you to Valerie for uh, agreeing to join me today. And thank you all for joining and for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> of course, we have to acknowledge at the very beginning the ongoing genocide in Gaza, which is... Uh, both maybe the immediate Im impetus for our meeting today, um, because this isn't simply an academic lecture. This is what's happening in Gaza is exactly, um, you know, what we're going to be talking about. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, um, uh, it has implications way beyond Gaza, what's going on that we'll talk about today. I write in my book, War Against the People, um, about what I call global Palestine. In other words, that Palestine isn't only a localized issue between Israelis and Palestinians with all its, of course, it does have its unique uh, uh, features. Um, but at the same time, um, it's really kind of a laboratory. And to the degree that Israel is exporting its weaponry and its tactics of population control and its surveillance systems, and its policing systems and technologies of repression. And as we'll talk about in a, in a couple of minutes, also a bigger concept of a security state. Um, you know, it becomes an issue really for everyone because it resonates very much with the ruling classes, um, both in terms of, as I'll mention in a minute, in terms of the whole global system, but also in every single country where, uh, where governments are becoming more and more repressive, so that uh, so that uh, really what's happening in Gaza can be seen as a preview to some degree, as what is what happening is what's happening in other countries in which Israel's involved, but at the same time could be happening 
uh, uh, in every country. Because Gaza is uh, what the military people would call a hybrid war. It's this, it's this, it, 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 it's this mixture of conventional warfare using F-35 stealth bombers and uh, modern artillery and, and, and naval uh, uh, artillery, naval missiles and submarines and the whole arsenal of conventional weaponry. Um, but at the same time, you know, soldiers and infantry and everything else, but at the same time fighting against a non-state actor um, that doesn't have those military capabilities um, and, and able to kind of uh, pivot from being a conventional war into a war against people. Uh, that are that are re rebelling against the repressive regimes. So, you know, so Gaza, you know, is not only something to really keep in our minds today as the genocide is going on, but at the same time, it really is in some ways the archetype of the kind of warfare that we're going to be seeing and we are seeing and, and we'll be seeing more and more throughout the world, I think. So what I'd like to do is take, a, a, they've given me up to a half an hour, <laughs> Uh, there's a lot to say. I don't know if we'll we'll finish everything, but what I'd like to do is share um, a, uh, share a presentation I prepared um, about this, and um, uh, you know because I think it it it'll make it more uh, the more visual it is, the more uh, uh, the more easy it's going to be for us to really follow. So here's a all right. Uh, okay. So basically, um, you know, we're going to start with, uh, you know, with Israel that really is in many ways, we'll come back to this, really a center for uh, technologies, again, tactics, like Nadia said, tactics of population control, uh, hybrid warfare, wars against the people, but also of conventional warfare. I mean, uh, we have to understand that Israel isn't only a client of the United States, and to some degree Europe, but, uh, you know, that uh, Israel uh, is the number two arms supplier to China after Russia. Uh, little Israel is the number two arms supplier to India after Russia. And as you can see here, it has extensions all over the world, and not only to the, to the, uh, the major powers, but virtually to every country uh, that exists. Because, again, even in countries... Um, that you know the Americans have never heard of, like Equatorial Guiana, you have repressive regimes uh, that very much need uh, this kind of Israeli uh, war against the people sort of technology. So Israel really is a very good window for getting into um, um, these kinds of issues. So, um, da, 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 da. all right, I don't want to get to the next. Uh, what is okay here all right um you know i'm not going to get into this whole thing about the global capitalism but this is really the big global context you know in which uh, in which all of this is really happening and every place has its own story in other words israel and the palestinians certainly is a story of settler colonialism uh different from that of new zealand i think because uh because here the settler colonialism uh, has it hasn't been completed and uh, and the uh, and the colonized, the Palestinians are the majority population, and have not given up on their national aspirations, and have the power, as we can see in Gaza and in the West Bank, to resist. So that there's built into, I think, Israeli settler colonialism, uh, a degree of insecurity and of the need to repress and the need to uh, to erase. You know, the need to, for genocide uh, in a way that maybe is is lacking in New Zealand, where where, you know, it's the settlers have become so overly uh, uh, dominant that the uh, that the colonized don't have nationalist claims. I mean, there's other issues I know uh, in New Zealand that are very important, but I think it's a different level of settler colonialism. And that's what drives, I think, uh, what Israel is doing today. But the fact that Israel has this is this welcome map out. That the fact that Israel has, uh, you know, access to countries all over the world and the support of countries all over the world has to do with these larger issues. 
the whole issue, I'm not going to get into this, we don't really have time, but of global neoliberalism, you know, in which 1% of the population of the world controls 50% 50 uh, 50 of the world's wealth, um, in which you have a military security industrial complex. You know, this, this industry we're talking about is a $2.5 trillion a year industry. So, you know, you've got not only the repressive elements, but the... Uh, the economic elements involved. You've got climate change because wars today are for, for to a large degree resource wars. You've got disaster capitalism that Nomi Klein certainly wrote about in the shock doctrine that, that, that kicks in. You've got the technologies of repression, again, that Israel is really pioneering, although Israel's not the only actor. You've got this whole concept of, of, of surplus humanity you know, where 85% of the world's population lives on less than $10 a day and uh, and are vulnerable to climate predations and to and to poverty and to uh, and to repression. Um, and at the same time, of course, is chronic insecurity in the world itself. And insecurity is really what's feeding this. So the insecurity of Israel versus the Palestinians in a sense, has been multiplied outward, and it links up. It shades into the global insecurities, uh, you know, that exist. You know, food insecurity, water insecurity, engine, engine, and energy insecurity. I mean, all of the lists that you see in front of you today. So all of this kind of together and more, of course, creates this. You know what? Uh, what the um, Earth scientists have called catastrophic convergence. And within this catastrophic convergence, in a sense, if you think about fortress, the fortress global north, in a way, um, the way the world's, uh, the 1% and the world's ruling classes are trying to deal with this is through military management. And this is war against the people. Because until, you know, the last few decades, capitalism had a very smiley face. Ronald McDonald and Walt Disney and... You know, there was the American dream and there was soft power. And the idea was that if you worked hard and really had the Protestant ethic, you could succeed. Well, that's closed down, certainly since the rise of neoliberalism in the 70s and 80s. And uh, and as everybody is getting excluded from the from the economy, including the middle class young people of the global north, um, the whole system has to become more repressive. And as the system becomes more repressive and then you add all these other factors into it, that's where you get what I call war against the people, military management. And I argue that there's no country better prepared for military management than Israel. You know, the United States and Europe and Russia and China even, uh, their military arsenals are much more geared towards conventional warfare. It's Israel with its century-long war against the Palestinian people that has developed those kinds of weapons and, and control systems and technologies of repression and the whole concept, again, of a security state that, uh, that, that has the weaponry and the approach to war against the people that's often lacking in these countries that have larger uh, arsenals themselves. So Israel is a very good place to look at. Now, Again, you know, uh, uh, without getting into all this, you know, you've got the, the the whole global north, global south division. That's that's very clear. <clears throat> but it's not only clear, you know, in economic and political and other terms, but but certainly in terms of all the barriers that are being built in the world, you know, uh, so that as the global north, uh, you know, uh, uh, it becomes a fortress global north, you know, and uh, and securitizes itself against the rest of the world, this is where, and you see all these securitized borders uh, in the world that exactly um, seal off the global north in a way from, from the unrest of the global south from which it's taking its, uh, its resources. This is where, you know, you see a direct link between this where Israel's involved in virtually all these kinds of barriers that are both land barriers, but they're also like off Australia, they're also sea barriers. You know, Israel has its underground barrier that it uh, pioneered in Gaza. It didn't work very well. Um, but, you know, this is a, a good, uh, you know, 
a concrete manifestation of what we're talking about. And of course, then Israel becomes, um, you know, one of the world's leaders in walls. That's one of its one of its exports from the more primitive wall that are built in the West Bank. You know, uh, through uh, you know all the high tech that it's developed over the years. Um, you know, the the, uh, uh, the 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 wall that Trump uh, loves uh, with Mexico is often called the Mexican Palestinian border because it's Boeing and Elbit systems that are building that barrier uh, in Mexico. And, you know, uh, these kinds of uh, of technologies like uh, Rafael systems, a century tech remote weapon station, this is what lines every hundred meters along the border of Gaza. You have these these uh, uh, automatic uh, the, these surveillance posts uh, with automatic machine gun fire and so on. So you know borders are, are a way to sort of get into some of the things we're talking about. And so here you begin to see the whole issue of the global north, global south, where um, the new landscape of conflict is what we call you know what's called uh, resource wars over oil, water, minerals, timber, other sorts of resources that are found, especially you can see along this belt around the equator and some of the most in the poorest countries of the world, but then are taken and looted and brought into the global north. Um, and so what you can see that translated uh, into military terms is this is the world according to the Pentagon. The world is divided into commands. You know, you have the European command and the uh, the central command in, in, in the Middle East and the Afro African command, whose who's actual uh, headquarters is in Frankfurt, Germany, um, you know, and, and Latin America and Asia and so on. And for the first time in 9-11, from 9-11 from on, for the first time, the U.S. started a North American command. So the United States itself is today under an American military command. So you can really see the, the global militarization that's taking place, that's extending into Africa, because also there wasn't an African command until about 20, uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And the United States and North America become a part of that as well. So you can see the militarization of the world, and in a sense, this dystopic sort of view of a fortressed 1%, you know, and everyone else living outside the walls. Um, and you can see it in global military expenditures as well. You know, the United States having, you know, spending about 40% of the world of, of, of uh, you know, of, of, of the expenditure on militaries comes from the United States and, and its allies and so on. Um, and this creates then what's, what, uh, well, I call and other people call the everywhere war. And these, so these are secure credit wars. You know, the war is to secure, to secure the ruling class, to secure your borders, to secure the flow of resources, right? Um, um, uh, in a way to secure your population, although within that you're repressing your population as well. And in battle space, I mean, these are the terms that the modern military are using. You don't talk about a battlefield anymore. A battlefield is localized. You still have battlefields. You know, you can have a battle uh, somewhere with it, with another force, but essentially the entire world is seen as battle space. From your urban neighborhoods in in Wellington to uh, you know to the uh, the frontiers of Afghanistan, it's all battle space. And armies have and uh, armies, security forces, police forces, because the whole gradation has to be able to function effectively in. In, in battle space and insecure cratic wars that don't have the same concrete goals of victory and uh, and and whatever it is that conventional wars do. And you can see how it's, uh, uh, you know, how it's broken down in a sense. And the bottom line of all of this is pacification. This is a term that I think is very important. I'll come back to it in a second. This is really the goal uh, of the capitalist system, but of all the the ruling classes and the and the militaries everywhere is to pacify. You're not going. There's no victory in, in a securocratic war. It's like the previous slide said, military management. So if you think in terms of management and population control, 
that that figures into uh, into uh, pacification. So if you can see today, you know, in this uh, 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 chart I prepared, you see, uh, you know, we think of war as conventional interstate wars. But in fact, uh, you know, I hopefully uh, the Ukraine won't lead to an exception to this. But in fact, the last real conventional interstate war that involved two or more major powers was the Korean War. You know, you've had smaller wars, Iran-Iraq, and of course the, the Israeli-Arab wars and so on, and Ukraine now, and you know, you've had a lot of other smaller wars, but in terms of a major conventional interstate war, I mean, they're not, they're, they're still possible, obviously, uh, and the arsenals are still there and they could be triggered, but, but they're not the kinds of wars that are being fought today. The kinds of wars that are being fought today are securocratic wars against the people. So that you can see in this chart, the goal of conventional war is victory. It's pretty clear. And you and the enemy surrenders and you occupy the territory and sometimes you get plunder or you get geopolitical strategic advantage. You get whatever you want out of, uh, out of defeating your enemy. In securocratic wars, they're open-ended. They're total wars open-ended in global battle space using non-conventional weaponry because you're not fighting uh, conventional armies uh, and there aren't enemies. There's another concept that's really interesting. It's called the universal adversary that militaries use. And that is anything, anybody, any group that is threatening the system. It could be terrorists. Terrorists are the are the you know, the, the, the term we use, you know, in this very broad sense, you know, terrorism, but, you know, could be uh, a criminals, migrants, uh, dissidents, um, you know, peoples of different races, minority groups, whoever, you know, your adversary is or to the system is kind of a universal adversary. And that becomes this very vague, ambiguous, a generalized enemy that the secure wars, and that's what justifies and make them so broad uh, and so all encompassing because they're not going after an enemy, they're going after a threat, you see, and, and, and that makes it much more generalizable. So you've got all these kinds of wars. The war we have today in Gaza is really what Israel calls a high intensity operation. It's calling its war in Gaza an operation, um, you know, partly for military for legal reasons, because if it's not if it's falls short of a war, then it doesn't have to uh, abide by a lot of the uh, international laws that have to do with war, like the treatment of prisoners, because it's not a war; it's simply an operation. But it it, it certainly is a kind of a hybrid war, and so on. And then, without getting into all of this, you see, there's a whole gradation that goes from asymmetric military wars abroad down to, you see, it goes down to asymmetric militarized uh, 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 policing at home. So you can see the gradation from, from Gaza and from, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, hybrid wars abroad all the way down to your local neighborhood and policing. And that's what I'm trying to say. Securocratic wars encompasses uh, you know, conventional and, uh, you know, all the way to policing. And that's really Israel's niche, because that's what Israel has really, that kind of war against the people is what Israel has per per perfected in its in its time, uh, its century of war with Palestinians. So pacification, really quickly, um, it's a global pro uh, uh, project. You can see a fabricating a social order that's conducive to, to capitalist accumulation. That's the big, uh, you know, overall goal in a sense. It's a form of governmentality that suppresses opposition to a point where resistance is impossible. That's the management part. You you make resistance impossible, and then you maintain that that level of control. Pacification secures the insecurity of the system. So the pacification of the Palestinians secures the permanent insecurity of Palestinians as a colonized people that have to continue to resist colonization. They can never accept it. 
But then again, if you project it out uh, globally into other and to other parts of the world, it secures whatever the insecurity that the universal adversaries, uh, you know, bring into uh, into the equation and whatever conflict we're talking about. It requires that the authorities know everything. It leads to a security state, which is a model that Israel is really trying to export today. Uh, and uh, and it relies on self-pacification, you know, uh, so that, you know, you go to the airport and, uh, you know, you take off your shoes, you take out your computer by yourself. Nobody tells you to do it. There's a self-pacification. All right. So much for the theory. I don't want to. Uh, and, and there's much more we can say about battle space. And and everything else in war against the people. I'm, I, I, but to just to get to Israel in the couple minutes I have left, you see. So Israel has this this niche um, that is able to develop high tech weapon systems. You know, I mean, Israel does have a convention and helps the United States and Europe uh, develop conventional weaponry. For example, Israel has a majority stake in the Watchkeeper drone, which is the EU's new uh, militarized drone. But at the same time, Israel specializes in securitization and population control and therefore develops weaponry and, and technologies of repression for that. But at the same time, niche three is it's very good at framing. This is the Hasbara, you know, that it's so famous for helping uh, 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 countries to frame the repression in terms of uh, security and enemies and and all of that. I'm not going to get into that now, but Israel's really pioneered a whole kind of war of what's called lawfare that's really going against the whole corpus of international humanitarian law. It's another story. And Israel, of course, possesses a Palestinian laboratory. There's not many countries that have six million people that they can do with whatever they want, with no oversight like Israel is doing uh, and so on. And so, as you can see, Israel's in this very pivotal position between major powers. It's a strategic ally of the United States. It's again very close to China, but at the same time, with local hegemons and, and, and even warlords. Israel is good at conventional warfare, but also specializes in war against the people. That's a span that, that most countries don't have. Israel develop, has high-tech weaponry and tactics, but at the same time, it knows, it, it, it knows how to make its weaponry uh, field-friendly for soldiers, for example, that, uh, uh, you know, that don't come from the global north. And again, this is some of the reach of Israel. Uh, I just want to just go over really just in, in, in the three minutes I have left. Do I have them left, Nadia? <laughs> I, um, oh, good, Jeff. You're good. Keep just, going. Just to look at, 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 at... I've got... Okay. Just, just to give you a really quick view. You know, Israel has a whole series of, uh, of spy satellites. Um, so that, you know, we have to take into account, obviously, the surveillance and the weapons capability of, uh, of, of, of satellite systems that Israel has. It gives it really a global reach. Uh, and, uh, and that, of course, gets into uh, its ability to conduct uh, cyber warfare. Um, you know, this is its unit, its very famous unit, 8,200, which is, you know, its intelligence unit that, that really has global reach, uh, but that can get into every single Palestinian telephone and into every single Palestinian room. Um, and of course, AI that, that comes out of this because the satellite system, of course, is key towards it to uh, linking to the new AI targeting systems and so on that Israel is using in Gaza. You know, it's got three systems right now. Has uh, Habsura, which means like the gospel or the message, the alchemists and depths of vision, I don't know, where these the, the words are the names are probably generated by AI, where they can target the 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 AI systems gener they generate the targets rather than the uh, than the military, and they can generate more targets than the military is capable of even attacking. And you could see, and Gaza has become the main uh, laboratory for the use of AI targeting. Uh, uh, you know, through Israel. 
Um, and of course, again, cyber warfare comes out of this as well. And, and then we go to the use of drones. Um, you know, Israel has field tested all its drones, especially the Aton drone here in Gaza. These drone systems over the years and the different attacks on Gaza, you know, have that's really literally where Israel has developed the capabilities of these of these drones. Uh, Israel is the world's leader in drones. I think 60 percent of the world's military drones are produced uh, by Israel. And, uh, you know, Elbit systems and uh um, the the Hermes drone that was also and is being used today in Gaza, both surveillance, uh, AI targeting, but also, of course, uh, they're militarized. Missile systems, you know, that are specially geared. You know, what Israel's one of Israel's specialties is taking these military systems and making them user friendly for individual soldiers. So you don't need combat vehicles and launchers and so on, but also for police. So you can even see in the evolution of the weaponry, as we'll see in one second, that it goes from the military to the police. Also high tech, you know, targeting systems. It isn't only the weapons, the actual hardware, but it's the weapon systems. Ro robotics is another one of Israel's specialties, again, developed in the Palestinian laboratory, uh, like the Guardium here. And I'm not going to get, this is a whole area I'm not going to get into, but nanotechnology, which is something we have to know about. Nano, I think a nano weapon, you know, just is, you know, is a, is a thousand, a million times more powerful than a nuclear bomb. And we're not aware at all of how Israel, Israel, China, Italy, Germany, and the United States are some of the world's leaders in the development of the military uses of nanotechnology. A nano is uh, uh, is um, um, a millionth of a meter. It, it's you know it's it, it's a molecule uh, size kind of thing, but it can be militarized in all kinds of ways. I'm not going to get into now, but this is one of the most you know the uh, 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 this is the type of military system that is most funded today by the Pentagon. Is nanotechnology? We very seldom hear about it. And, you know, this is a, a how's this for a robot that could develop, that could uh, uh, deliver uh, all kinds of nano poisons and so on. I won't get into it. These are systems, I won't get into them all right now, that have been developed in Gaza, specifically in Gaza. Some of them today, like the sponge bomb, that's a kind of a chemical uh, mass that expands out and hardens that Israel could use as it's going through the tunnels, the Hamas tunnels, and seal uh, all the uh, entrances coming in, partly to prevent ambushes, but partly to seal in Hamas fighters and so on. I, all kinds of things, uh, 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 anti-jamming systems, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, this ball here at the bottom, I don't know if you can see it with the... At any rate, that's a kind of a, 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 a robot. Uh, uh, it's called eyeball uh, uh, that you throw into a room and it gives you a 360 degree view of the room. The Iron Dome system, of course, all these sorts of systems. These are all being developed in Gaza itself. And, I'll, and I'm finishing in one sec. Um, again, the targeting systems. And I just want to read you this... Uh, uh, this, um, well, I don't know if I, this, uh, this quote, I think is important. Uh, and it, it comes from an article of Yuval Avraham that was in Haaretz. The Israeli army has files on the vast majority of potential targets in Gaza, including homes, which stipulate the number of civilians who are likely to be killed in an attack on a particular target. This number is calculated and known in advance to the Army's intelligence units, who also know shortly before carrying out an attack roughly how many civilians are certain to be killed. Nothing happens by accident. When a three-year-old girl is killed in a home in Gaza, it's because someone in the Army decided it wasn't a big deal for her to be killed, that it was a price worth paying in order to, uh, to hit a, another target. We're not Hamas, says this Israeli military guy. These are not random 
rockets. Everything is intentional. We know exactly how much collateral damage there is in, in every home. And I won't play uh, the video of the AI uh, targeting. And and just in the last 30 seconds, then going into a secure aircraft war, bringing all this into your own community in the security state. So you see what Israel does in, in, in Western militaries, you have a wall between the military and domestic uh, security forces and police. They don't, they don't mix with each other. You know, in the United States, it's illegal for the CIA to talk to the FBI without special uh, uh, channels. In Israel is telling countries, forget that. You have to bring these services together. And these are some of the units that span, paramilitary units that span police and military. So we're talking not only weapon systems, but structures as well. Surveillance, of course. Uh, and, uh, you know, Israel's uses its 600 checkpoints in the West Bank to develop, uh, uh, you know, very sophisticated biometric surveillance systems. Uh, these red wolf, uh, blue wolf, blue wolf systems all over the West Bank, thousands of cameras that read, uh, do facial recognition. And then that's brought into systems like Nice System, which is a major Israeli company that sells these safe city programs uh, all over the world to cities. Um, so it comes right directly into police forces. Of course, the Pegasus spyware that we know, all the spyware that uh, Israel and companies like NSO are pioneering. Um, and weaponry, again, that go from the military directly into the police. For example, Israel now produces for police uh, a, a Uzi submachine gun pistol. You know, you don't need a machine. It's not, it's a machine gun, but it fits into a holster for, for police. This is an example of the militarization of the police and, of course, non-lethal technologies. So... I said my part, I'll leave Frank Zappa to uh, to summarize. And um, okay, I hope I stayed within my time. Thanks. Kilda, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, you paint a very dystopian picture, which I think you've been dwelling in for some time and have a really heightened awareness of, but I'm aware that there's people who are probably listening to this who... Um, I worry, uh, maybe falling into a sense of despair about the scale of the problems and the technologies we face. And so um, we're going to listen to Val now, but just something I want to share is, you know, we as Palestinians, I mean, the, the comment that was made there about the intentionality of killing civilians, we're very aware of that. Um, and I think now we're coming into a space where the rest of the world is maybe f finally starting to believe us. Um, but I do want you to think, Jeff, as we come to the question time, I am going to invite you because I've read a lot of your writing and I know what you're about, that I want to invite you to talk about how we too can play asymmetrical warfare, because I think that's the task that we, the people, need to do as well. Um, we may not have these technologies, but together we can confront um, these systems and we have the capacity to play our own type of asymmetrical warfare. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit when we get to the questions, but I'm going to hand over now to Valerie just to talk to us a little bit about what she's been gleaning about the New Zealand context. I know she's been studying up, refreshing some of that knowledge she's had for years and um, gleaning some new insights on what the current context of our military connections are and our military systems here in New Zealand. So thanks, Valerie. Kia ora, everyone. I'm just checking to see that people can see the, the screen share. Okay, yeah, bye-bye. All right. Kei te mihi ki a koutou koutou mai nei i tēnei pō, a kei te mihi ki te tangata whenua o Aotearoa katoa, he tiaki ina ahika o konei. Kei te mihi ki nga kai kōrero o tēnei pō, he tino, um, tino nui te onore māku um, ki te ki te kōrero ki a kōrua, a rā ko Jeff, ko Nāria. Um, kei te mihi ki a, ki a koutou katoa, um, ko whakapere ki te whakako, whakarongo, um, ki te kaupapa, ki te hāpai i te kaupapa o a free Palestine. Um, no reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora everyone.
Thank you so much to everybody for being here. And um, a really big thanks to Jeff and to Nadia for kind of setting the scene. And I think that lots of the stuff that um, Jeff talked about really flows on quite well to what it is that I want to talk about um, here tonight. So there's a number of ways that New Zealand is directly tied um, to the genocide. And the focus of this corridor is around the military and intelligence activities and the supply companies rather than the consumer goods that feature more prominently in the kind of boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign work. I wanna say and reiterate what Nadia said that this is a very preliminary study for me. Um, it's a work in progress and I'm gathering more info as I go. So if you've got things um, that are not included tonight that you think I should know about or other stuff that you come across that's useful, I'd really appreciate hearing about it. Um, you can get in touch with Peace Action Wellington by email and I'll put that in the chat. So some of the stuff is gonna be um, info that's familiar to people. Some of it I hope will be new information that you don't know about. Um, so the focus tonight, first of all, what the military and intelligence agencies are doing. Second, police and military contracts with companies assisting the IDF and participating in the genocide. Um, three, what local companies um, are doing. And four, what KiwiSaver and New Zealand Superfund investments exist. And finally, kind of um, maybe we'll pick this up in the in the in the questions a little bit. What can we do about all of this? Because the purpose of this is to is to arm people um, with information and knowledge so that we can um, so that we can resist, so that we can fight back. All right. So we'll turn first to what the military and intelligence agencies are doing directly. And most of us will know about the Red Sea deployment. On the 23rd of January, the New Zealand government announced that a six member defense force would, team would be deployed to assist the United States bombing of Yemen because the Houthis began targeting ships heading to Israel via the Red Sea and warned all international shipping companies against dealing with Israeli ports. The euphemistically named Operation Prosperity Guardian seems something more appropriate to a fundamentalist Christian abstinence program, but its naming is pretty typical of US kind of military doublespeak, war is peace. What it means in, in, in reality is that New Zealand has joined just a handful of countries that are now bombing Yemen. Um, and just quickly on the intelligence agencies, the Government Communications Security Bureau, the GCSB, we have no public information about what role the GCSB has in the current war on Gaza or in providing targeting information for the US strikes on the Houthis. We do know that the GCSB has been based at US CENTCOM, uh, that's US Central Command in Bahrain, and journalist Nikki Hager has written extensively about the long-term involvement of the GCSB in targeting Iran and about their signals intelligence supporting military strikes through the 20 years of the war in Afghanistan. So I think we should conclude that they're providing assistance in Operation Prosperity. And similarly, tur turning to the security intelligence services, we should anticipate that the SIS will be, has been and will be keeping a very close eye on Palestinian solidarity activism, um, particularly following on the designation of the political wing of Hamas as a terrorist organization by the New Zealand government last week. We can expect that that will intensify. So, a couple of more other defense missions that you might be unaware of is New Zealand Defense Force deploys up to 28 personnel to the multinational force and observers based in the Sinai, which has its origins in the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty of 1979. In return for getting the Sinai back, which Israel had occupied during the Six-Day War, Egypt agreed to keep almost all of its army out of the peninsula and allow an international force to patrol the area alongside its border. The multinational force and observers was deployed in this border region in 1981, and New Zealand has been a part of that force since then. Egypt and Israel jointly constructed a station on the border between Gaza and Egypt. This is the Rafa border crossing, and many of you will have heard a lot about Rafa um, in the last month in particular. Obviously, um, the Rafa border closing is closed. Israel retains effective control over the Palestinian territories, partly because it has been able to use the Rafah border station and the buffer of the Sinai to isolate Gaza from the outside world. Although Israel handed control back 
um, of Rafah back to Egypt in 2005, the Egyptian government has followed Israel's wishes by severely constraining the movement of goods and people across the border. It is currently closed. Um, and the multinational force and observers plays an important role in maintaining the siege of Gaza. The 1,700 members of the force from militaries around the world are stationed close to the Gaza Strip and have the authority to seize and de de detain any Palestinians or pro-Palestinian activists who cross the border of the Gaza Strip into Egypt. By patrolling the deserts of the Eastern Sinai, the MFO soldiers keep Egyptians away from the Gaza Strip. It's worth noting that this mission is also not a United Nations mission. So moving on from, um, from the Sinai, um, the New Zealand Defense Forces also deployed um, up to eight personnel as part of the United Nations Troop Supervision Organization, where military observers patrol and monitor ceasefires um, in the Golan Heights and in Lebanon. So the Golan Heights was captured by Israel from Syria in 1967 during the Six Day War. Israel illegally annexed the Golan Heights in 1981 and the international community, with the exception of the United States and Israel, regard the Golan Heights to be Syrian territory held by Israel under military occupation. U.S. President Donald Trump endorsed the Israeli in annexation in 2019. And the picture that you're looking at is a picture of a, of a tweet sent by a member of the U.S. administration in 2019, um, effectively including the Golan Heights as part of, um, of, of Israel. The key point about these missions is that they serve at the leisure of the countries that are supposedly covered by the truce. They really don't have any capability to prevent truces from being broken. They don't, they aren't there to protect uh, Palestinian civilians, um, and they can only report to the Security Council when they do see violations. Um, and we know what happens at the UN Security Council when it comes to such matters and Israel. New Zealand political strategist Paul Buchanan commented to me that the recent clashes across the Lebanon-Israel border and in the Golan Heights suggest that their monitor monitoring is ineffectual. Um, and it sort of reminded him of the siege of Sarajevo where UN blue helmets stood around while Muslim civilians were slaughtered. On the plus side, um, Palestinian, New Zealand Palestinian activist Don Carson noted to me that almost all New Zealand Defense Force personnel that did serve in su such missions often came home much more sympathetic to the Palestinian struggle, or at least not supportive of the Israeli um, occupation. So moving on to military war exercises with Israel. Israel is a participant in the biannual RIMPAC training. So some of you might um, know that RIMPAC stands for Rim of the Pacific. Um, these are the world's largest naval war training exercises led by the US military. But you might also realize that Israel has, is not located anywhere near the Pacific Ocean. Um, so it is you know, a really strange and questionable undertaking. RIMPAC is going to be happening again this year in June. It runs for a couple of months in June, from June through August, and is typically conducted around the islands of, of Hawaii with devastating impacts on the land and the sea with live fire training using missiles and bombs. And we've had an active campaign going against RIMPAC for the last couple of years. The picture that you're actually looking at on, at the, on the screen though, is actually a giant naval exercise in the Red Sea that happened two years ago, which was called um, IMAX, so the International Maritime Exercise. And weirdly, New Zealand and Israel are both listed as participants in this um, joint naval exercise um, that focused on the use of unmanned naval systems and the use of artificial intelligence, which is what Jeff was talking about, these unmanned systems and, and AI targeting systems. It is really unclear to me. I was not able to find out what role the New Zealand Defense Force played in this exercise and if there were new Navy unmanned systems that were used um, that were used as part of this exercise. There are a great many US military training exercises that New Zealand and Israel are both party to, but finding out more details about those training exercises is not always very um, is not always very clear. So I'm keen to do some more work around what what some of these training exercises are. So turning to New Zealand police and military contracts with companies assisting the IDF and participating in the genocide, we have Lockheed Martin. Surprise, surprise! The world's largest arms company. 
Um, their F-35 stealth fighter jets are literally being used to bomb Gaza right this minute. Um, Israel just purchased a third squadron of F-35 stealth fighter jets from Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin is involved in all kinds of weapons development uh, from nuclear weapons all the way through aerial systems um, to naval systems, but they are also involved very much in issues around population control and surveillance, uh, space technology and the rest. So um, Lockheed Martin's New Zealand workforce is 200 people and they're primarily working for the New Zealand Defence Force and the New Zealand Police. They also provide services to New Zealand Fire and Customs, Fire Service and to New Zealand Customs. They're based out at Trentham, um, and they're also, of course, a major investor in Rocket Lab. They're the sponsor of the annual Aerospace Summit in Christchurch, and they work very closely with a number of Israeli arms manufacturers, including Raphael. So I just want to turn very briefly to Rocket Lab, kind of pivoting off talking about um, Lockheed Martin, because Lockheed is a major investor in Rocket Lab, but Rocket Lab have been launching military surveillance site satellites from Mahia for the US Department of Defense and also for private surveillance companies, one of which is called Black Sky. So Black Sky's work is geared towards military intelligence for the United States, and they are also selling their intel to US allies in the region. They have publicly stated that they were surveilling Gaza um, on the 7th of October this, this past year. Um, so I'm going to, this is going to be a little bit like a, a list of things, and it might be a little bit overwhelming. It's probably not necessary to hold on to all of these, but we can have some of these, some, um, yeah, some place where this information is going to be able to, to be referred to more um, going forward. So I just want to touch on a few of them. One of them is CAE New Zealand, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of US weapons company CAE. The company was awarded a $38 million um, contract with the New Zealand Defence Force in 2018 for training and given New Zealand Defence Industry Award in 2021. Well, CAE often also has contracts with Israeli company, weapons company Elbit to provide training for the Israeli Air Force and are a partner with Elbit for weapons supply contracts in Canada. Um, and I think this is the way, this kind of really dovetails with a lot of the stuff that Jeff is talking about. Um, we've got weapons companies that are doing business here in New Zealand they're developing stuff in Israel. That stuff is being exported to companies, to countries all over the world um, and in being imported and used by other companies. So um, I want to talk a little bit about Auckland-based Cubic Defense now. So Cubic, um, Cubic has received literally hundreds of thousands of dollars of public money, millions of dollars through defense contracts and also public money through Callahan Innovation. And you can see on your screen, They've got actually a summer intern project that um, New Zealand taxpayers are paying $42,000 to Cubic, a weapons company, so that they can have a couple of nice summer in interns. Um, they are a wholly owned subsidiary of US-based Cubic Defense, a corporation specializing in military communication systems and training that holds contracts with the IDF and the US military. Cubic in New Zealand used to be called Oskmar International. They plan to illegally export military training gear to Israel in 2005, and this was thwarted by some local peace researchers. Um, and again, pivoting off what Jeff was talking about, drone warfare, the New Zealand Defense Force announced, announced in December that it would buy drones from two companies. One is EPE, who are supplying Skydio drones. And Israel contacted Skydio hours after the October 7th attacks with requests for short range reconnaissance drones. The company, said yes. And in the three weeks following that um, 7th of October date, Skydio sent more than 100 drones to the IDF with more to come. EPE has established an office in New Zealand to provide focused and responsive service and support to the New Zealand Defence Force and the New Zealand Police. And the other company that is supplying drones to the New Zealand Defence Force has been supplying armed drones to Israel since 1973, and that's called Teledyne. Um, it is the largest listed exporter of weaponry from Britain to Israel. We are due to buy 30 to 40 Teledyne Black Hornet drones this year. And this lovely picture that you see on your screen is actually um, the result of the work of four Palestinian solidarity, solidarity activists in Wales last year who took direct action against Teledyne for its supply of weapons to Israel. 
Two people dismantled military equipment from the inside of the factory whilst others occupied the roof. In total, it is alleged the four people damaged over 1.2 million pounds worth of equipment belonging to the company, severely disrupting the production of weaponry. Oh, boo-hoo. They smashed windows, daubed red paint on the walls, drilled holes in the roof, and used crowbars to destroy the office. The factory was closed for about three weeks as a result. Yay for them. Terra Caps um, is New Zealand's Caterpillar equipment dealer. Caterpillar has long been involved and implicated in Israel's violent occupation, and its modified D9 bulldozers are being used in Gaza right now. So the photograph you're looking at on the screen is the armored bulldozers preparing to enter Gaza in October 2023. Um, TerraCat, which is the, cat, the Caterpillar dealer in New Zealand, recently developed a new New Zealand Army vehicle, the Beach Preparation and Recovery Vehicle. And as you can see, they have locations across the country. Um, there are also Israeli companies that are supplying directly to the um, New Zealand Defence Force, including Robo Team. So this is a Tel Aviv based company that is going to be supplying the NZDF with dozens of remotely controlled robots. Um, they were established in 2009 by a couple of guys who served in the Israeli Special Forces, and they supplied a robot to the IDF that was actively used in Operation Protective Edge and Israeli war in Gaza in 2014, which is how they got into the business of developing robots, militarized robots. Um, and some of you will know what Krav Maga is. Well, Protect Krav Maga is a special kind of Krav Maga, is an Israeli martial art designed by Itay Gil, a former IDF captain and special forces paratrooper. His company Protect now consults to civilian and government agencies across the world. He was recently in New Zealand offering training and workshops. He trained representatives of the New Zealand police and defense forces as well as security professionals, and has suggested that the IDF, excuse me, has suggested the NZDF are seriously considering updating their training program to incorporate Israeli methods that have been refined with experience. Um, and kind of last, but certainly not least, um, in terms of the um, local situation is Raycon. Hopefully lots of you already know about Raycon, Raycon has been um, supplying what's called crystal oscillators that are used in joint direct action mu munitions. Basically, they're used in bombs to make them into smart bombs. Raycon continues to maintain that their products had not been designed for military use, and the question of where they were used was up to the customers to answer. And if you look at the, at the news story that's on your screen, you can see US-made munitions killed 43 civilians in two documented Israeli airstrikes, and these were specifically the joint direct action munitions. Um, Raycon listed, uh, this, is, this is their building up in Auckland that was subject to a protest a number of years ago. They listed US weapons company Rockwell Collins as a customer in their initial public offering. Um, their Auckland office has often been the site of Palestinian solidarity protests. And Indeed, it should be. So just to finish up a little bit, I want to talk about KiwiSaver and the New Zealand Super Fund, the superannuation fund. So there's two ways in which uh, both KiwiSaver and the Super Fund are assisting in the genocide. First, the investments in companies involved in illegal settlements based on the UN, um, UN lists and also investments in weapons companies that are profiteering from the genocide right now that are not actually on that list. So KiwiSaver, of course, is the national retirement saving schemes that we all put into with our weekly pay pack. They have a total investment of around $160 billion. Mindful Money, which is a local website, um, their analysis reveals that there are 367 funds out of a total of 800 funds that have invested in companies that are supporting the Israeli illegal Israeli settlements. This list of company draws on research undertaken by the UN Human Rights Council, focusing on companies with a direct role in maintaining the illegal settlements. The total invested at the end of March, 2023 was about 122 million. There is a specific tool you can check to see if your own KiwiSaver fund is currently investing in these companies using the free mindful money fund checker tool. And I'll get um, Ellie to pop the link in the, um, in the chat so people can have a look at that. 
However, I note that this does not include many of the weapons companies that are directly profiting from the genocide in Gaza through arms sales to Israel and partnerships with Israeli arms companies. So I just want to turn very briefly to the New Zealand Super Fund, which of course is a multi-billion dollar fund of New Zealand taxpayer money that is invested in the global market, intending to cover the pension payments to all eligible people over age 65 in New Zealand. So that's the difference with the Super Fund and Kiwi Savers. So in 2024, its value was about $70 billion. While the Superfund theoretically aligns its investments with the UN principles for responsible investment and states in its mandate that it avoids prejudice to New Zealand's reputation as a responsible member of the world community, it is nevertheless an active supporter of the occupation of Palestine. And on your screen, you'll see a listing of about five or six companies. We've got Thales at the top, BAE Systems, Rolls-Royce, Axon, L3, RTX Corporation, which used to be called Raytheon and Textron. These are literally weapons companies that are directly profiting from the war. These are companies, these are arms companies. They're almost all of top 10 weapons companies that are all selling massive um, US weapons, British weapons um, to the Israeli Defense Force. There are other ways that the super fund is invested, including um, the companies that are on, on the UN list. And um, you'll think, see companies like Airbnb, um, and General Mills and Motorola that are also very much part of supporting the illegal occupation. So I just want to turn very briefly to the kind of political questions that we need to be making as a movement. And we can open this up for some, I guess, some questions as what kinds of demands should we be making? This is the kind of stuff Jeff and, and Nadia were talking about, uh, about imposing a comprehensive military and security embargo on Israel abandoning discussions of a new security alliance with the United States in the form of AUKUS, abandoning things like the Five Eyes, that we really need to be pushing forward uh, with some very clear um, political demands, um, but that we also need to back those up with action. And so I just want to end with a couple of things that, um, and always is, what are we going to do with this information that we have? This is not an intellectual exercise to know how Israel is helping to massacre people in Palestine. This is about us stopping this happening. So just for those of us who are here in Wellington, action at Parliament tomorrow, 1 p.m. Friday, U.S. Under Secretary of State is visiting um, at the law school buildings for a public lecture. So we're encouraging people to get along to that. And we are very much encouraging people to get involved if you're not already involved in regular organizing. Because at some stage, the immediacy of the conflict will come to an end. But what happens from that point forward depends on international solidarity to push forward for the decolonization of Palestine. Kia ora koutou. Kia ora Val. Thank you so much. Um, okay. I want to get stuck into it. We already had a few questions come through. And I think what we've taken on now is, and, and if you've got more questions, please chuck them in the chat. But you've given us, both of you have given us a lot of information to digest. And so now I'm going to ask you with some assistance in helping us digest it. What I think Marilyn had a good question. Marilyn is a founder of uh, or co-founder of Alternative Jewish Voices here in Aotearoa, Jeff. And her question, I think, is one that you will have some real insights into. She said, where are the weaknesses? These strengths are daunting, but what form of protest or awareness does Israel fear? Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, Israel's in a very interesting uh, uh, position in that it, um, you know, it try it, that gets into the Hasbara part. The, the 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 public relations, the image making and, and everything. Uh and plus the the lawfare in which Israel's trying to defer, I mean it presents itself as a European democracy. And that of course is is one way in which it um uh ingratiates itself into the populations of the global north. You know, there's a racial subtext here we're white we're European, we're civilized. Netanyahu said 
at the beginning of this uh, assault on Gaza, that we're the children of light and Hamas are the children of darkness. I mean, it's it's even in those 19th century racist terms, you've got this kind of uh, uh, of talk. Um, and so Israel is very is very uh, protective of its image. But at the same time, it doesn't fear sanctions. I think this is what's really important. And that is that um, <clears throat> you, you get a, a country, you know, Israel gets a, a kind of an immunity from any kind of sanctions because it's made itself so useful to the international community. You know, you look at even a Saudi Arabia. I mean, the Saudi street is seething, um, um, both in terms of what Israel's doing to the Palestinians in Gaza, but over, you know, the repression of the, uh, the repressive regime of Saudi Arabia itself, but Saudi Arabia's complicity in what's happening in Gaza. You know, well, Saudi Arabia is dying to normalize with Israel. Precisely for those reasons, because Israel will protect it against Iran and Israel will protect it against its own population. And so Saudi Arabia has said to Israel, you know, it, it, there was a demand publicly for the street saying we're not going to normalize with Israel unless uh, the Palestinian issue is addressed and some two state solution, which is also illusionary, uh, is created. Well, they came down from that. Saudi Arabia now says <clears throat> we'll normalize with Israel if they express an intent that at some point in the future they'd be willing to consider some kind of a political resolution with the Palestinians. So that's where Israel knows that it's protected because, uh, you know, it's trying to protect its image, but it's a it position internationally, certainly among governments, is not uh, is not endangered by what it's doing. On the contrary, you know, uh, every weapon company whose weapons are developed in Gaza, as I should on their websites, if you go into their websites, uh, they all say buy our equipment because, you know, it's field tested in Gaza. It's combat tested in Gaza. In other words, it's not tested in some range in rural Texas. This is under combat conditions. So that Israel actually uses, I, this is a resource for Israel, what it's doing to the Palestinians. Uh, and so I think the, uh, the, the, the real problem we're facing, just in, in one more word, that, that goes into what you said asked at the very beginning, Nadia, about what can we be doing as the left or whatever, or the, and that is that the entire international system, this deserves a whole other conversation, really runs on, in a, on a transactional basis. It's all transactional. It's all deals. It's all short term. It's all, you know, what can we get out of it and so on. There are no allies. There's no rules-based international order. There's human rights, international law. These are all laughable kinds of things. Whereas we, the people, do talk about values and justice, and peace, and human rights, and dignity, and, 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 and all of those sorts of things. And that's the disconnect, because it's almost impossible for us to penetrate the decision-making uh, you know, circles within governments, because we're not even talking the same language. They're simply transactional. And in the transactional world, Israel is king. Israel is, is one of the best countries, this little tiny country, in terms of all the transactional relationships it, it, it makes. And that really gives it an immunity to the sorts of value-based politics that we that we espouse. So at some point, we've got to try to deal with that. How do we insert ourselves into a transactional, you know, international political process? Otherwise, countries like Israel just continue, not only with impunity, but again, the worst the crimes, the better the, the, the PR in terms of the transactional military sales and relationships that they want to do. Hey, Jeff, I want to push you that's some more. Short, that's my short answer. That, no, that is a good answer. And I think it's good for people to not be naive about what we're wading into. I think I think we have we're experiencing a reckoning because people are like, why are the tactics that we're using not working? What, what they are been 
what they're doing has been revealed to us. Surely the world should should fly in and 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 do something about this because we have this rules based order. So I appreciate your forthrightness about that, but I'm going to press you again because I believe that Israel does have weaknesses, and I think you know those weaknesses because you know Israel intimately. So what do you think those weaknesses are? And, and maybe well, maybe, again. I, maybe I can ask Jeff. Okay, um, yeah. Val. Maybe I can ask you just to expand a little bit because what we are seeing and 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 Nadia alluded to that Marilyn, who asked that question, is part of a group called Alternative Jewish Voices. We've seen a lot of resistance within the United States um, Jewish Voice for Peace, and I'm wondering what you think about, I guess, those those communities of resistance outside um, Jewish resistance outside of Israel. Does that have any? Mm -hmm carry any currency, because that is a growing movement. Right. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, you know, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, I, I, again, you know, this is really an issue. How how do we break through <clears throat> this trans transactional uh, system? Because, <clears throat> you know, you had 800,000 people in the streets in London a few weeks ago you had 300,000 people in DC in a, in a in a big uh, march in Washington for for Palestinian rights it's true an entire young generation of uh, of Jews in the United States has become a Jewish voice for peace the largest organization of young Jews in the US is not only critical it's anti-zionist i mean it came out with a statement saying we are anti-zionist so it's it's you can't get any clearer than that <clears throat> but the problem is that that has that has you know very little political clout I mean, we saw it with the arab spring <laughs> i mean there's been uprisings all over the worlds of people i mean we know what the problems are i think uh, uh and the problems are linked in, in in our world but but we're simply not able to translate that strength we have in the streets I think maybe one problem is, and, and this gets into a whole other area in terms of our organization, and that is that we're, we're, um, you, you know, when I was active as a young person in the '60s, the famous '60s, you know, our word was organize and and engage in the political world. Today, you have a you have social movements, and social movements are very broad. And they're very ephemeral because you can bring hundreds of thousands of people out on the street, but you can't sustain it. And there's no demand and there's no organization and there's no follow up and there's no program. And I think that's that's our problem. One of the issues of the Palestinians, I have to say, is that, you know, they don't have a political program. I'm I'm very involved uh, with what's a Palestinian led group called the One Democratic State Campaign. And we're trying to insert the idea of one democratic state you know, as as the political program, because you can't be in a political struggle without a political program. So one of the problems with this with, with Palestinian solidarity is that people are in solidarity with Palestinians and it's very strong, but you're not going to liberate Palestine from New Zealand. What do the Palestinians want? What's the program? What do they want us to advocate for? That's the missing piece right now and i'm cutting them all the slack because there's a lot of reasons for that but that's uh, i think if we can in if we can get a critical mass of palestinians with critical israelis like me behind a political program um and then mobilize all of you abroad that provides that link between the massive mobilization of the street and that political demand that we need then to insert into the into the political process, but simply protesting uh, in a transactional system that runs by itself without any of that those links, direct links, or demands or asks, is kind of futile. And in that, in the situation that exists today, Israel doesn't feel threatened at all. I don't think by what's happening because it doesn't see it that mobilization of the streets, including the Jewish community, being translated into any kind of meaningful political uh, opposition to Israel. It's interesting to me in a way that you say that, um, Jeff, because 
because it certainly seems like in the United States anyway, that there is a great deal of um, discussion about Joe Biden's support wavering as a result of his um, very milk toast position or rather his, his very pro-Zionist position. Um, yeah, and that it, it may be like it may be a bit of a stretch to suggest that the US presidential election it could hinge very much um, on what happens in, in Gaza. Like, I think that's, that, that, that is certainly part of the, the discussion that's going on in the US in a way that it certainly never has um, in the past. And I think it's, it's a really fascinating and interesting time because there, there has been, I think a more forthright conversation in the United States about why the United States is such a dogged um, supporter of Israel. And I guess, yeah, that's kind of the linchpin is if the United States' support of Israel becomes more conditional, does that mean Israel becomes more amenable to some, yeah, change? Well, just uh, just in a word, you know, Israel's strength in the United States is not the administration. It doesn't care who's president. It thumbs its nose, the, although all the presidents are pro-Zionist. You know, the danger with Biden, and this is something we have to keep our eyes on, in, in the next few days, according to what he said, he's supposed to present <clears throat> his plan for how to resolve this. The problem is the Palestinians are a nuisance. They're not an issue in and of themselves for the United States or for <clears throat> or, or, or for Europe or for the corporations. They're, <clears throat> they're desperate to get back to normalization because the big fish to fry are Iran, Chinese incursions into this region. You know, just before the war began, uh, Biden announced the IMIC corridor project, you know, the Israel-Middle East corridor that would go from India, you know, into the Middle East end up and, you know, bring Saudi Arabia and Jordan in, end up in Haifa port that becomes the main hub <clears throat> for all this Middle Eastern Indian trade going into Europe as a counterpoint to the um, to the Belt and Road Initiative of the Chinese. Uh, and Russia's, of course, uh, present in Syria and so on. So that these are the big things. You know, the United States is trying to keep its hegemony uh, in the Middle East, and uh, of which Israel, again, is an important key. That's the big story. So the Palestinian issue, for them, the idea is how do we just quietize this, you know? And so what Biden is going to suggest, and this is something we have to keep our eyes on, on the fine print, is, again, a two-state solution, which is really what I call two-state apartheid. Okay? It has to be apartheid because you have to have Israel as one state on 78% of Palestine, but it has to include the major settlements. In the United States, it has 750,000 settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. It's not going to send them home. Nobody's going to force it. So, so if Israel's going to expand out to about 85% of Palestine, and the Palestinians are going to be locked, who are the majority population, are going to be locked into these little Bantu stands. Um, that's what's coming down the pipeline. So he's trying to find the balance between how do we how do we present a two state idea which lets us talk about Palestinian rights and yes we're concerned about Palestinians and and, and all of that, but to to make a sweetened apartheid, how do you make it good enough that the Palestinians will accept it? even though it's really apartheid. And that's the best that you're going to get out of the United States. If Trump comes in, you know, you don't even got to get that anymore. So that's what I'm trying to say is that, is that uh, you know, in this transactional world, the Palestinian issue by itself means nothing. It's, all, it's a nuisance. And the question is, what do you have to do in order to quietize, not resolve, manage, quietize this so to the degree that we can Saudi Arabia and every, we can get on with normalization and that really becomes the political question for us and there again is global Palestine because it's not only Palestine you know I mean Palestine is in our face so it's the best case scenario for us on the left to try to figure out strategies and figure out what to do but you've got a billion other <laughs> conflicts of the world that are are invisible 
that again we have to try to 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 address in a more in a more global Palestinian uh, sort of a way. I don't know. Those are just thoughts. Of, no, of thank you, head. Jeff. Look, that's think, a whole other discussion I, I that we think should I'm, have. I'm, but, it uh, is, and there are a few uh, that we could have, and we should continue having. And I think, um, you know, the quote that's coming to mind for me, and I think you'll know this one. Edward Said was a bit of a fan of the Gramsci quote: "Pessimism of the intellect." And that is to say that when we are educated and we understand the way that power operates and manoeuvres, that we should feel fucking daunted, you know. But the other side to that Gramsci quote is optimism of the will. And I certainly think, you know, as a Palestinian, we have no choice but to persist and to continue being that nuisance. And I think there was a clue in something you said, which I just want to offer for our close, because there are other questions that people have out there that um, I think take us down, you know, other roads that we could talk about, and there's some analysis around the US there that people have, have added in the chat. But I think that, you know, on a fundamental level, the task ahead for us here in Aotearoa is actually clear. It's in the clue that you left us earlier when you were talking about the 60s and 70s. It's in organising. It's in and within organisations and building organisations. This must not just be a moment. A moment, it needs to be a movement and an organized movement that understands how to reckon with and disentangle ourselves from these parts of this system which implicates us all. And so I think we're capable of it. Is it going to be an overnight fix? Absolutely not. Um, I think we should feel daunted, but I also think that we also must be optimistic about what can be achieved when we organize, because... Can I say um, a half a sentence? Yeah, yes, go. If it's optimistic, Jeff, leave? yes, you can. <laughs> no, that's exactly the point. I don't want people to leave thinking that, you know, I'm being defeatist and this is all just transactional. There's nothing that... No, I'm trying to lay out in stark terms what the problems are, what the issues are, what we're facing. That's why I wrote my book, War Against the People. I know nothing. I wrote a book about something I know nothing about. I know nothing about the military, but I but I said, how can I, the two and a half trillion dollar industry that's creating havoc in our world, and I, as someone on the left, don't know anything about it? So, you know, there's huge blind spots and, and we're not connecting issues very well. But I'm doing that not in order to say, wow, this is, it's so overwhelming that we might as well just go home. If I thought that, I would uh, I'd go back to being an anthropologist like I... I set out to be. I think we can win. That's the point. We can win. We can prevail. Uh, Israel is not strong. I say to the Palestinians all the time, uh, Israel is not as strong as you think it is. It's strong with governments, but it's not strong with the people. And the, and you Palestinians who are, you know, just see the, the Israeli soldiers every day, you're not as weak as you think you are because you've got global support. So our job is how do we take, like you're saying, those strengths and weaknesses, and how do we organize around them? How do we have a good analysis? How do we become strategic? And that's what's lacking. So what frust I, I'm not optimistic, it's struggle. I don't believe in hope and optimism. I believe in struggle. But what, what frustrates me is when we're not organized, and so we're not even in the political game, which is often the case. But if we really organize and analyze well and, and marshal our forces, I think we're in a struggle and I think we can prevail in that struggle. We've got the numbers. Uh, uh, so I'd want to leave people with that idea that, that we're in a struggle and it's not easy, but it's not, you know, we can win. But <clears throat> there are things that we have to do that we're not doing uh, yeah. in order to, to prevail. And, and again, that's for another time, but I think I, I want to leave people on the optimism of the will. <laughs> yeah, not so, on any kind, by any means, any sense of defeatism or anything like that. Kia ora, Jeff. Well, that is a fantastic was my place sense. to end. And I really, we really appreciate the time that you've generously given us tonight. <clears throat> um, I think that you have been really forthright with us about the challenges we face. And yeah, there's absolutely a lot more work to be done. But I look around at Zooms like this and at all the events we do, we know that we've got the people 
It's just about channeling and translating that into organized power. And that that's the challenge that lies in front of us. So kia ora, Jeff. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Val. Um, as people said, we've got a couple of events this week. For those of you based in Wellington, bring um, noisy things down to Parliament. Tomorrow, 1 p.m., we're going to be making some noise. And also 11.30, Victoria University, U.S. Assistant Secretary... De under Secretary of State, Under Secretary of State is going to be on campus, and I think we should keep being nuisances as well as getting ourselves a little bit more organised in the long term. Okay, so a karakia to close us up now, um, and I'm going to wish everyone a safe evening, and thank you for joining us. Tutua mai irunga, tutua mai iraro, tutua mai iroto, tutua mai iwaho. Ki a tau ai, te mauri ai, te mauri tū, te mauri ora, ki te kātoa. Hau mi e, hui e, tai ki e. Thank you, everyone, and um, we'll see you Thank soon. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Valerie. Okay, Thanks, thank everyone. Ko mārie. Ko mārie.